we return to the message on the mountain tonight. The mountain message. And you know that's in uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. I've enjoyed the series so far. This is our fourth sermon. If you remember, we started at the end asking ourselves a very important question. When we were done with the teaching from the Lord Jesus, what were we going to do with it? Were we going to use it and found our lives on it like the wise man did? Or were we going to be foolish? Were we going to be fools and just listen to it but do nothing with it? We've looked at what Jesus saw. We've, we've heard what he said the first time about being poor in spirit. And tonight we return to that passage. My message this evening is entitled, Jars of Clay or Whitewashed Tombs. Jars of clay or whitewashed tombs. Put your finger there in Matthew chapter 3 and you can flip over to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. You may be familiar with this verse. But in this verse, it involves the prophet Samuel and Jehovah God. In fact, in this verse, the prophet Samuel in the Old Testament is being addressed, is being spoken to by God. He said this to Samuel, look, Samuel, I do not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but I, God, look at the heart. I don't look on the outside, God says, I look on the heart. Now in our text this evening, which we're going to be actually covering several verses, Matthew 5 verses 3 all the way up through 16, in that text... The Son of God is now addressing us. And here's what he's saying. I have not changed. I was the God of the Old Testament. I'm the God of the New Testament. I was the God of the first century. I was the God of the B.C. era. I'm the God of the A.D. era. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm still looking inside. I'm still looking at the heart. Only Jesus goes a little more specific. He says, here's what I'm looking for. Here's what I'm looking. When I go into your heart and look, here's what I want to see. I want to see the poor in spirit. Remember, we talked about that last week. Petahas, beggar, poor. We're not just supposed to be in poverty. Spiritually, we need to recognize that we are beggar poor. That we have nothing except what we have been given by the gracious hand of of God. Jesus says, I am looking for those. I'm looking for those who mourn. Penteo. Mourning. You want to know what that means? To lament, to grieve, to wail out like you would at a funeral. Like when someone dies, that kind of grieving. Jesus wants us in our heart to be poor in spirit because we're mourning over the fact that we have sinned against him. Jesus says, I want to see the poor in spirit. I want to look in your heart and see those who mourn, those who are, are sad for the sin that they've committed, sad that they were one of the, the very ones who Jesus climbed on the cross and died for. Jesus says, I want to see the meek, the prause. You know what meek means there? Gentle, humble. He wants us to be gentle, humble, meek, knowing that we've been saved. Knowing that we have an eternity in heaven, but knowing that there's only one reason why, and that's Jesus. There's no proud, there's no pride involved uh, like the Pharisees of that day, pointing their finger at people and condemning them. God doesn't want that. Jesus doesn't want to see that. He wants to see those who hunger. Those who hunger, the word there is pinao. It means to crave. He wants people, he wants to look in your heart and see that you crave, that you pine for what? For righteousness. He wants to see those who hunger, who crave and pine, who, who thirst. Think of that psalm as the deer panteth for the water. God wants to see, Jesus wants to see that we hunger, we thirst for righteousness. What is righteousness? Sinlessness. Doing it God's way. Jesus wants us to hunger for that, to thirst for that. In opposite, in stark contrast to what we used to hunger and thirst for. And that was the satisfaction of the world. Jesus goes on, I want to see the merciful. I want to see the compassionate. You want to know who he wants to see? The good Samaritans. We talked about them this morning. 
God wants us to have that compassion for Him, obviously, but for, but for the lost world, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. He wants us to be merciful. But you want to know the main reason why He wants us to be merciful? Because we want Him to be merciful to us. Oh, we want His saving mercy, right? We, we don't want what we deserve, and yet we're oftentimes very eager to hand out exactly what they deserve. And that's not what Christ wants. When he looks into the heart, he wants to see the pure in heart. Katharos. You want to know what that means? The pure in heart? Free. Free from corruption. Free from sin. Free from guilt. Praise God. Do you know that you can be free from corruption? Free from sin? Free from guilt? The guilt of sin and the penalty that comes with it because of Jesus Christ? Do you realize that once you confess something to Jesus Christ, even after you're saved, once you confess a sin to Him and you truly repent of it, He doesn't think of it anymore. You are forgiven. So many times I have dealt with guilt, false guilt, not conviction, false guilt that comes from Satan over stuff that I've already given to the Lord and have not revisited. And at times when I begin to get in that stupor of guilt, God reminds me, that's not from me. That is from your adversary, the devil. Cast that care on me and I'll care for you. Rebuke the devil and he will flee from you. Don't allow Satan to paralyze you with false guilt. Last in the the Beatitudes, Jesus says, I want to see in the heart of my children, I want to see the peacemakers. Those who have made peace by my blood, those who have made peace with God, but also those who are obeying my commands that say, doing everything that is possible. Colossians says, doing everything that is possible, live at peace with all men. Oh, we have to go to battle sometimes, but we can still do it with a loving, meek, gentle attitude. He even wants us to be peacemakers with our enemies, not compromising, not compromising, but living at peace with all men. Jesus says, I'm looking for earthen vessels. He says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. I'm looking for earthen vessels, rough, unattractive pottery. I'm looking for jars of clay, is what he says. I'm looking for jars of clay. They realize that their only worth, their only worth is the treasure that is being poured into them. The treasure that is not theirs. The treasure that is only theirs by the grace of my Father, Jesus says, and only theirs through faith in me. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. The treasure which is the glory. You want to know that treasure that's in you, jar of clay? It's the treasure that is the glory of God's magnificence. And you want to know how it's displayed? In the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. That is what, Jesus says, that is who I am. I'm looking for. And when he looks into our hearts and that's what he sees, guess what Jesus says? You will be blessed. You will be happy. You will be fulfilled. As we said not last week, not as the world defines it. Temporary. Temporary. Satisfaction based upon our happenstances. He says, no, not as the world defines it, but as I define it. Then he goes on in the passage to let us know, back to our text tonight, he says, hey, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be scorned. You're going to be abused. Many are going to uh, revile you, some translations say. Many will say all sorts of evil against you. Jesus says, no matter. In all of that, my jars of clay, you know what he says? In our text tonight, he says, in all of that, my jars of clay, you can rejoice exceedingly. You can be exceedingly glad. Why? Jesus says, because you suffer for me. You suffer for my sake. You suffer for my name. And the reward, the glory that we as his children that are suffering for him, the reward that we will receive one day in heaven, will, if we receive nothing here on this earth, Nothing but that persecution. The reward we're going to receive will be so great that the load that you bear now, that temporary load, it's going to seem light. It's going to seem momentary. It's going to seem insignificant. 
Church, that's who Jesus is looking for. That's who he is looking for. That is who he wants to redeem. That is who he wants to use. That is who he wants to reward. Jars of clay. How do you think he's doing? What he wants to see, it's who he's looking for. What do you think the results are of his search? Scripture gives us a hint. All throughout Scripture, it gives us a hint. Let me ask you these questions. How many were saved from the flood? Eight. Eight people were saved from the flood. How many people survived Sodom and Gomorrah? Four and then three, right? She survived, but on the way out, she turned into a pillar of salt. Brother Harold, I put down four first and had to go back and scratch it out because Lot's wife didn't make it. Three. Remember Abraham crying out, 100 righteous people, 50 righteous people, 10 righteous people. How many really left? Three, and they weren't so righteous. How much of Israel, the northern and the southern kingdoms, how much of Israel was left after the Assyrian conquering after the Babylonian conquering how much was left very little a teeny tiny remnant how many disciples were there how many disciples 12 scratch 1 11 replace 1 12 12 men you see where I'm going. And if you're not getting the point, listen to Matthew 7, 13, and 14. I read it there, I quoted or I mentioned it this morning. Matthew 7, 13, and 14 gives us an absolute spotlight answer on how are we doing, how is Jesus doing when he looks for those that have the heart that he wants us to have. It says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that lead to destructions. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who are the few. Who are the many? Who are the many? They're not the jars of clay. The jars of clay, the true jars of clay are few. Scripture says that who are the many? They're the whitewashed tombs. Whitewashed tombs. Listen as Jesus addresses them. Matthew 23, 25 through 28. Matthew 23, 25 through 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. You understand what Jesus is saying there? Until the inside's clean, the outside can never be truly clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 27, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you also outwardly just to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Jesus at that moment in time was addressing the religious leaders of that day. But hear me, in the 21st century, he is still addressing people. People, religious people, just like them. People who look magnificently clean on the outside, but are filthy, dirty on the inside. People who have attained righteousness, oh yes, but it's a self-righteousness. They've never been gifted with redemption, with redemptive righteousness. These are people Jesus is talking to even today who are proud in spirit, not poor. They don't mourn their sin. They make excuse for it. They're not merciful at all. No, they're merciless. To sum it up, Jesus is speaking to anyone, anyone who cares more about what man sees and thinks than what God sees and knows. Is he speaking to anyone here tonight? 
That's a question you have to ask yourself. It's a question I had to ask myself this week. If so, this is what he's saying. Matthew 23 makes it clear that he's not just saying it, but he is actually saying it over and over and over. You want to know what Jesus is saying to the whitewashed tombs? Woe, you hypocrites! The word woe here, ua, ua, a. I'm sorry, ua. I had to practice. You know, e u u a. No, it didn't help. The word woe here is actually ua a. I say that because I want you to know what it is. It's an interjection. For my teachers in here, that means exclamation point, right? Interjection of public condemnation. Woe to you hypocrites. And here is what is enclosed in that word woe. Beware. Anguish, grief, affliction, distress, despair, misery, and calamity is all that awaits you. You, who is you? Those who put on false appearances. That's what a hypocrite is. Those who act in their life as if they're on a stage performing for men. Those who put higher value on what men see than what God knows. Those who look like life on the outside look alive. But on the inside, they smell like death. That's a whitewashed tomb. Now, Jesus puts his own exclamation point on this interjection, and he does this in verse 33. He does this by asking a rhetorical question. Jesus says, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Whitewashed tombs, he is saying, those who care more about what men think than what God knows, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? The answer You can't. You can't save Jesus Christ. You can't save you yielding by repentance to the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Now I know it's Sunday night. I know that. I know that the majority of people in this room are saved or claim to be saved, have been going to church for a long time. I know that. I know that. But I'm still telling you That I pray that this evening there's one in here that no matter how long you've been going to church, no matter how scripture you know, the Holy Spirit is convicting you right now and you've realized that you are that whitewashed tomb. The only righteousness you know that you possess is self-righteousness. Then I beg you. I beg you not to hide behind pride or fear or, or the reputation of what people might say. What will that be worth in hell? I beg you right now to claim the saving power of Jesus Christ, whose scripture tells us, knew no sin, but was made sin for us, that we might be called the righteousness of God in him. Now, we transition back to Matthew 5. We look at verses 13 through 16. In these verses... We see Christ giving some marching orders. You want to know who he's giving marching orders to? His jars of clay. Here's what he says, starting in verse 13. You, you my jars of clay, you my children, you who have been redeemed by me. Here's what you're to do. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light, verse 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father in heaven. Who are we? Who is Jesus speaking to here? Who are we? We are jars of clay. What are we to be? Salt and light. Salt and light. This is what we are to be. 
How? How are we to be salt and light? With good works. Parentheses, you should put God works. You say, Pastor, I didn't think salvation was about good works. We're not talking about salvation. Remember I said, who are we? Jars of clay. Who are we? Children of God. The good works that I'm, not ta- that I'm talking about here are not uh, to save us. They are a result. They are evidence of our salvation. Once we have accepted Jesus Christ, the rest of our Christian walk, the rest of our sanctification walk is all about good works. It's all about God works. Why? The verse tells us. For the glory of God. We are a reflection of His glory when He saves us in redemption. And we're in an even brighter reflection of His glory as we shine our practical righteousness, which only can be seen because of our positional righteousness. But once we are saved for the glory of God, we're to be about the good works of God. We are here in this world, not of it. We are on assignment. We are on assignment for the kingdom of God. We're in a foreign land. And guess what? In this land, in this foreign land, all of its citizens, that's not us. See, we're here on a heavenly visa. But all of the citizens in this foreign land are spiritually dry. In fact, they're not just spiritually dry, they are spiritually dehydrated. To survive, they only need one thing. To survive, they must have one thing, and that is to drink from what? The living water. The living water that is Jesus Christ. Remember, I said we're the salt. That is our calling as the salt. It is our duty to do what? To live lives that are glorifying to God. To live lives that are unique. To live lives that are set apart. To live lives that are different from the world. That are set apart to God. Why? So then we can be used by God to make them thirsty. Salt is great for making people thirsty. God uses us as the salt. When we're living the life that is pleasing to Him, our lifestyle is going to be different to the world and we're praying that God will use that life to make them thirsty. And then guess what He gives us the privilege of doing? Sharing with them the good news of the living water of Jesus Christ that will not only deliver them from their dying state of spiritual dehydration, but it will also allow them to experience something that they'll only have to experience once. Once they've taken a drink of the living water of Jesus Christ, their thirst will be quenched for all eternity. Never will it end. Now, listen to me. We're called to be salt. If we're not willing to do this, then there is a problem. Oh, it's not a problem between you and I. It's a problem between myself and God, or it's a problem between you and God. Let me explain. Do you know that it is impossible for pure salt to lose its effectiveness? It's impossible for pure salt to lose any of its effectiveness. However, if it's not pure... If the salt has been contaminated by something. Let me give you an example. The Dead Sea over in Israel. Okay? It has lots of salt in it. But it's not pure salt. Uh, No, in fact, this salt has been contaminated by gypsum and by various other minerals. Guess what has happened to the salt in the Dead Sea? It is not near as effective. In fact, its effectiveness is very much hindered. And guess what that kind of salt, salt that has been contaminated, guess what it's good for? Nothing but, and here's where you're going to see how it makes sense what Jesus says when he says it's only good to be thrown out and trampled on. You want to know what this kind of salt's good for? To throw on the walking paths. In Bible days, they'd throw that salt on the walking paths and it would kill vegetation 
It would keep the walking paths clear and it would be trampled on by the foot of men. That is all that salt is good for. If we are not being the salt we are called to be and we are truly children of God, because if you've lived your life as a Christian claiming to be a Christian and you have yet to ever submit to God's calling to be the salt of the earth, you probably need to dive in with the Holy Spirit and examine Examine the foundation of your Christianity. But if we are saved and we are truly children of God, we are truly jars of clay and we're not being pure salt, then we need to take a step back. We need to get into God's word. We need to begin praying. We need to begin to ask the Holy Spirit to shine his convicting light on us, on our lives, to show us the sin. Show us what has contaminated us, what has hindered our effectiveness. Because it's then and only then that we can, rest- we can restore our lives, or the- the- Jesus can restore our lives by, conv- or by being convicted of that sin, by confessing it, clearing up that contamination, that we can go back to becoming the pure salt, being used by God as his element to make the lost world thirsty. We're salt. But that's not the only comparison Jesus makes. He also says that we're light. We are the light of the world, he says. A city that sets on a hill cannot be hidden. I'll never forget the weekend. Uh, it was the last weekend of September, headed right into October of 1994. That's the weekend that I had my, my airplane accident. Before the accident, we had flown from Texas through Oklahoma and Arizona and all the way out to California. We'd spent the night there. And the next day, we left. We didn't leave till evening time. In fact, the sun was already beginning to go down uh, uh, over the Pacific Ocean. And uh, we took off, and we were headed. Our destination was Las Vegas. Now, from where we were in Palomar, California, to Las Vegas was a decent flight, but it was over a lot of desert. And that night, the desert was dark. Dark. And then all of a sudden, we passed through a certain patch of desert. And like a beacon... There was Las Vegas. There was no way you could miss it. In fact, the Las Vegas itself is not attractive at all. And those we were only there a few hours, the majority of which we were asleep in a motel, got up and left early the next morning. That desert had been really, really dark. And it was very comforting. It was very refreshing. It was very assuring when all of a sudden, in the darkness, here was the city. A beaming beacon of hope for a young pilot. That's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be that city on a hill. And you want to know how our beacon can be bright? By living the life that Jesus said he wants to see in our heart. By living out the be attitudes that we've just gone over. That is how our light is going to radiate. That is how it's going to be a light that cannot be hidden. It cannot go unnoticed. It will be used by God to do what? To point the lost to the uniqueness of our lives. Allowing us then to say, listen, it's not about me. I'm only unique because of who? Jesus Christ and we point them right back to him because in the end he is the true source of the light we are simply a radiation of the reflection we want that to happen Christians we've got to listen to the good the great children's song that says this hide it under a bushel no I'm gonna let it shine Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Church, we cannot hide it under a bushel of sin. We cannot hide it under a bushel of self. We cannot hide it under a bushel of satanic, the attack, and and yielding to the stuff that Satan wants to put in our way, yielding to to just the great amount of stuff the world wants to offer us that will hinder our light, that will hide our light. We cannot do that. We've got to let it shine. Until when? Let it shine till Jesus comes. Let it shine till Jesus comes. And they, you say, who is they? The world those that are lost, those that are in the darkness of sin, 
What are they going to see when this shines? They're going to see our good works, our God works, the works that we're doing by his grace, by his mercy, with his power, with his spirit, and for his glory. Notice I didn't say anything except us being used. They're going to see those good works, those God works, and they're going to do it for the glory of God. Now let me tell you one other thing, and we'll be done this evening. There's a verse in the Bible that I love. We cannot ever use an excuse that, well, Lord, I want to do those good works. I'm your child. I want to be that jar of clay. I don't want to be that whitewashed tomb. But, Lord, I'm, I just can't. Lord, I just feel ill-equipped. I just don't feel like I'm... I don't have the equipment that I need. I mean, Pastor Rob gets up there and he knows the Word of God and he studies. And I mean, you've called him to be the preacher. Uh, Lord, I just don't have the equipment that I need. Well, it's an excuse, but it's an invalid excuse. Not because I said so, but because God's Word does. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture, that would be this, is given is breathed by God. It's given by inspiration of God. Hear me, it is profitable for doctrine, which is teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, that the woman of God, that the child of God may be complete. Listen, thoroughly equipped, thoroughly equipped for every good work there's no excuse he's given us all the equipment we need to be the salt and to be the light that he has called us to be Christians let's be those jars of clay let's be those jars of clay for the glory of God To stay up to date on current events at the church, check service times, or if you have questions about the Bible, please visit us at lbchurch.com or call 740-678-2738. Thanks for listening.